Good morning, men. Good morning. So, my wife and I went camping for a few days this week, and uh, I like to roast almonds. I like to do it myself, buy the raw almonds and then roast them, put a little olive oil on them, salt them, get them just right. And then I uh, decided, well, I'll take some of those camping. So I put them in a, a handful or two in a Ziploc bag and then put it in the cabinet in the camper. My wife uh, put the dry dog food in a Ziploc bag and put it in the cabinet in the camper. Now this camper is about 185 square feet. Now it's eight by 20 something. But think about your bedroom being 12 by 15 feet. A bedroom 12 by 15 feet, that's about 180 square feet. That's how big the camper is in the inside. So I'm gonna tell you, describe it to you. It has a, a dining room and a kitchen and a bathroom and a shower and a bedroom in 185 square feet, you know, so it's not very big. So about uh, one o'clock in the morning, I hear this sound, ah, 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 ah. My wife had gotten up for a midnight snack. snack. She had been thinking about those almonds and uh, got up and stumbled around in the dark in this 185 square foot camper. <laughs> And instead of putting her hand into the Ziploc bag with the almonds, she put it into the Ziploc bag with the dry dog food. <laughs> oh, so I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. Um, we're going to close up this Men Reaching Men series this morning. And we're going to do it by celebrating changed lives. We're going to do it by celebrating men reaching men. I want to go ahead and begin, though, with a, a shout-out like we, we do. And today, the shout-out goes to Journeymen. And it's, they're men from Edgewood Community Church. And uh, I did this on Google Translate. Wapun? 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 Anybody know that city? Wapun. Wapun. Wapun, uh, Wisconsin, and the leader there is our field rep in the area, who's Paul Neville. He actually lives in Brandon. I should have said just Brandon, Wisconsin, right? And uh, there are five men who've been meeting for uh, a year on the second and fourth Sundays of the month at 7 a.m., and they're using the, the video Bible study with us. And so I wonder if you would give these men a very rousing man in the mirror welcome and welcome them to the Bible study. One, two, three, hurrah. Welcome, guys. We're really glad to have you as part of the study. So, yes, the series has been Men Reaching Men, and today, a Men Reaching Men celebration. A quick review. We've had a number of ideas, big ideas and, and applications uh, for the series, but kind of like the overarching big idea has been this uh, uh, concept of intentional spiritual friendships and intentional spiritual uh, friendships. Here are the big ideas we've looked at. Uh, discipleship is one man caring enough about another man to help him build a, three things, a relationship with God, a worldview that's biblical and a lifestyle worthy of Christ. So that's sort of the, if you want to drill down on what, what it is that you're trying to accomplish when you are trying to reach another man, uh, you're trying to help him become a disciple, and that's that he would have a relationship with God and these other things. And then second, uh, in following, we had uh, be a friend, and we had the idea of praying with or for a man, serving a man in some way. For example, uh, you might help him build his fence, especially if it's between your yards and he has a loud barking big dog, uh, but that's a... Wouldn't be actually serving him, would it? That'd be serving yourself. And then uh, giving, uh, and, and we had books here where you could take a book and give a man a copy of a book that might be helpful. Then 
Uh, Jesus called us to go, not to wait around and see if they come to us. And David used the uh, very uh, memorable illustration uh, that a fireman doesn't wait outside a burning building and wait for the men to come out. Firemen go in, and that's what we were to do, to go where men are. And then uh, this idea, when we looked at developing your personal elevator speech and also showing you how you might help introduce a man to faith in Jesus, just take a man as far as he's willing to go toward Jesus at the moment. And then uh, the idea of what is an intentional spiritual friendship all about. It's built over time. It's a relationship, not a transaction. And then David Delk, uh, uh, excuse me, Brett Clemmer showed us the relationship diamond and just how relationships progress. And so the idea is, is that you'd, when you are a man and you're trying to reach another man, you're not trying to violate the process, the normal human process of building relationships. You don't walk up, it's John, right? Yeah, you don't walk up and say, hey, John, how you doing? I'm Pat. Say, would you like to get saved? You know, that's not the, that's not the way we do it. It's, uh, hey, John, how you doing? I'm Pat. You know, I like coffee. Would you like to get a cup of coffee sometime? And so there's a normal human process of building relationships. And we're not trying to push men. Uh, we're just trying to uh, build these intentional relationships over time. And then uh, the last time out, we talked about the importance and the necessity of really having a, a biblical worldview about church and a real man invests in his church and then he helps other men to do so as well. So the idea is that we do want to connect men to churches. Now, <clears throat> that may be something that's a few months down the road. In some cases, who knows, if a guy's had a bad experience with a, a church, he'd been bruised by a church, it might be a long time. But the point is, is that eventually it's the community of men and women uh, living their lives together that uh, Jesus came to install as his kingdom on earth. Okay, so the big idea for the day is this. It takes a man to teach a man to be a man. And so men need other men to reach uh, into their lives. You've been doing that. You've been doing that, and so today uh, we just want to open it up and have you share your stories, some of the stories that uh, you've been able to, in these last seven weeks, we've had a, a number of different uh, applications uh, suggested. One would be to just have a cup of coffee with a guy. Another was to uh, uh, serve a guy in some way. Um, uh, Brett gave the illustration of a man that he worked with that had a car in the shop, and so he was told Brett that he was going to have to take the bus to come to work, uh, to go home from work. Maybe both, I can't remember. But anyway, Brett volunteered to drive him home from work, and it was a little stilted at first since Brett was his boss, but after a couple of weeks, the relationship began to open up and uh, finally one day as Brett was dropping him, the man off in his driveway, he broke down and, and wept and, and they had a, a, a very deep and meaningful time of uh, connecting and ministry and Brett was able to be very help, helpful to that man. So <clears throat> um, we also had the idea of giving a man a book. It's a very easy such an easy way to reach out to men, especially if you're short on time. Say, hey, uh, are you a reader? So here's how I do it. So I give away several books a week. So when we were camping and leaving the campground, I went to the park office and told the ranger we were leaving a few minutes early uh, so that they could have some extra time to clean up the site for the next people if, if they wanted to know that. And so he was, so some park rangers, park rangers are not trained on how to interact with human beings. Um, they're kind of left, they're kind of left to their own devices. I'm, I'm, I could be wrong, but I've had a, but I'm, and so we're relatively new at this, but I've had enough experiences to know that some park rangers have uh, great people skills, and they're just like right there with you, and they make you feel so welcome. 
and then uh, a, a, a good percentage, and maybe not half, but a good percentage of the park rangers, it's like uh, you, f you feel like guilty that you're coming to their park to camp at their campsites. And so the guy at the campground where we were checking out was one of the latter. And so, I mean, it was like incredible. I walked in and this, I was telling, I was just telling him, I was trying to be nice, you know, let him know so they could, you know, have a, an easier work schedule and not have to do all the work, you know, in a short period of time, you know, spread it out a little bit, you know, go ahead and go in early, do the work. I was met with such suspicion, it was palpable. I couldn't believe it. Well, I took that as a challenge, and so I decided I would try to, you know, warm, warm up the, the, the relationship. And so we did, and finally, towards the end, I said, uh, I said uh, do you read books? And uh, he said, no, not really. I said, good, I have just the book for you. <laughs> so that's the way I do it. If a guy, I ask a guy, are you a reader? And if he says yes, I said, good, I've got a great book that I think you might enjoy. If he says no, I say, great, I've got a good book I think you might enjoy. And so uh, anyway, I've got now this connection with a, this, this, this man at this park. So when we go back, uh, you know, I'll see what the next step is. So that's my story uh, for, for the week. And uh, now what I want to do is just kind of open up the floor and, and during these last seven weeks, what are some of the, what are some of the stories that, that you have had? And then I want you to, um, so you can come forward if you want to. Uh, you can, Michael, can they just stay where they are if they want to? Stand where they are? You'd rather have them come up here. So, so it's all about you then and your convenience. Okay. <laughs> So we'll, uh, we'll have you come up here and uh, tell your stories. And so uh, who would like to uh, kick it off? All right, come a running. You can walk back. It says I obviously didn't bathe this morning. My men didn't show up. So uh, I guess they thought the prayer breakfast was sufficient for today. I do a lot of traveling. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Oklahoma City. <clears throat> wonderful place to be, Oklahoma City Airport. There, early in the morning, I, I knew I was going to have a long day, so I had stopped and had a uh, double water burger with jalapenos and cheese because I'm from Texas, and you can't get that here. And uh, so I had a real manly breakfast that morning, and there's only one place really to kind of go and be in this airport, and it's at this bar restaurant type spot. And so I eased up to the bar, and it was about 9 o'clock in the morning, and I ordered a uh, sparkling water with a twist of lime and uh, sat next to this man that was probably in his 40s. And we got a conversation opened up, and I watched him, and he ordered a double vodka. But when he ordered it, he'd already had that before. And I wasn't paying too much attention, but he had three of those while we were sitting there talking. And I come from a real heavy drinking past in my life, and I really know what tolerance is. And that would have put me on my uh, skinnies. But uh, we got to talking, and the guy was headed to a concert in Tempe, Arizona. And uh, he was asking me to help him, because it was obviously he was kind of getting out of whack. And when he handed me his driver's license, it said, not for driving. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, okay, we got a problem here. <laughs> Anyway, I, got to, I asked him, I said, where are you in your spiritual journey of life? And the guy literally, I mean, broke down. I'm talking sobbing, snot running out of his nose. I mean, it was one of those, uh, the magic button was pushed with this guy. And that button was Jesus Christ. And I cut off him drinking. I called the manager over and got some popcorn and got him some popcorn got him to drink two full huge glasses of water. I escorted him to the southwest gate and sat with him until I thought he got on the airplane. I was headed back to the bar to my seat and I hear them call his name over the loudspeaker. And I went, oh my goodness. So I walked way down to one end and looked in the bathroom, walked way down to the other end, looked in the bathroom. I never did find the guy, but I did get the guy's address prior to him leaving and he now is the proud owner of Man Namera uh, and several other books that I have. 
And I didn't quite take the man to the point of that journey of accepting Jesus Christ in his life at that exact moment because I really thought that he would have repeated anything I told him to repeat. I would rather him be sober when I had that conversation with him. But I can only pray that he remembers who I was when he gets those books <laughs> and that God has continued to work in his heart. Huh. That's a great story, Scott. Yep. Thank you so much. Wow, that's a great, that's a great one. Who would like to go next? Dave King. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll try to make this short. Um, one, uh, most of you, many of you know that I do uh, jail and prison ministry. And um, every week I, I do a message to a group of guys, not quite this big, but about half this size. Let's do that. So um, this week, Spirit was moving, and we did an altar call and had maybe 30 guys come up, which is pretty, uh, about half, half the room, and it was pretty remarkable. That was an experience, uh, uh, very interesting, but I don't, that's not the experience we're talking about here. That's a different one, but I say that because I, I think everything that we do in this area kind of lends toward contributing to the effect and the power of uh, all that ministry that we're doing every day. Uh, in this regard, the intentional spiritual friendship, I, have, I live in a condo building, and there are three guys in that building that I've started to pray for. And so uh, uh, just in the course of these last few weeks, praying for these guys, uh, I've gotten to know one of them pretty well. Um, at first, you know, I would pass by this guy. He would be sitting, like, with no shirt on, <laughs> smoking cigarettes and putting the ashes out in the, on the uh, walkway. And uh, kind of I'd say hi on the way by, but I'd never say anything at all. And uh, in the course of this process, praying for him, praying uh, uh, for this relationship, we've gotten to know one another because that has been a priority. And uh, that relationship has, well, become good enough to know that, you know, he plays games, uh, he's a poker player, and we talk about that. That's a touch thing, because I play poker too. And, and so we've gotten to develop a pretty good talking relationship. And this is a guy who's kind of a loner. He's kind of uh, by himself, you know, and obviously he doesn't have a lot of friends coming around. I don't know, I don't think he goes out to see a lot of different friends. So. I'm getting to the point of uh, having that talk. I'm inspired by, by the uh, instant connection, but this is more kind of the, the long-term deal. Uh, hopefully, it'll be a relationship that we can uh, just build on gracefully and slowly and permanently. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. Great job. Great job. Okay, next. Operate Trix. Um, so when Pat gave us this challenge, I thought, well, you know, who can I invite out for coffee? And so as I prayed about it, I just felt like God was telling me to approach a guy that I work with. And so um, uh, I did. I said, hey, let's just go out for coffee. He said, fine. And so he comes from a uh, Latino background. So we went across the street, and they have this um, restaurant that has all these different coffees. So he was really into that. So that was a plus. But uh, as we got talking, he said, you know... Uh, I used to be really into music, I played bass guitar, I was in a band, but now I'm, you know, married and I've got kids and I just don't have a lot of time for people. In fact, I hardly have any friends. And so uh, I really appreciate you inviting me out and, and getting together and stuff. And, and basically, he just had a lot of stuff that he's processing, you know, because he's got from a blended family and, and that kind of thing. And, and I came from that background as well. So we were able to talk and stuff. And so after that, then I gave him the Man in the Mirror book, and he was really interested. 24 things, you know, that I can be able to find out about, you know, uh, being a better man. And so uh, that conversation is just getting going. He's reading that book at home. 
home. Uh, I suggested maybe we could go over, you know, a chapter when we get together the next time. Uh, since we work together, we see each other all the time. And so, you know, he's warmed up in his friendship and stuff. And so that's been great. And it's just a continuing story to see where God leads, leads that. But one other thing um, that I have the privilege of is out at UCF, I have the opportunity to interact with a lot of international students. And uh, mostly they're uh, from either India or Iran. And uh, so these are not guys that I can just walk up to and say, hey, you know, would you like to be a Christian? But they're people who uh, don't know very much about Jesus and the Bible and things like that. And so I have the opportunity over many cups of coffee to be able to, you know, progressively, you know, just discuss who Jesus is and why he's important and why they might be, uh, why it might benefit them to learn more about him. So, you know, it's a great encouragement. And Pat, thanks for doing all that for us. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Charlie. Isn't that awesome? Wow. This is great. Charlie Fitzgerald. All right. Um, I had the opportunity uh, in my, uh, I live in a townhouse uh, kind of gated community, and um, there's a community mailbox. Uh, saw this big, uh, looked like a football player, uh, introduced myself to him, and um, we got to talking. And um, he was a, uh, he had played uh, football at James Madison University, and of course, I'm an ex football coach. Uh, having coached for 30 years. And so we got to visit a little bit about football. And the next thing I know, he's, he's starting to share his whole life with me. He's sharing that he and his wife are going through a divorce. And I mean, he breaks down, this big guy. I mean, he's, he's probably 285 pound type guy, probably 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, um, and so I get a chance to, to share with him at that time, you know, just about the hope that he has and about Jesus. And, and he was a Christian. He is a Christian. He just has kind of gone away from, uh, you know, his, his path. And uh, uh, he had gone to church, ex actually at a church that, I'd go, that I go to. And uh, so I invited him uh, to breakfast. Uh, we went to IHOP a couple of days later and had a chance to I mean, he just shared his whole life story with me and had a chance just to sit there and uh, have a one-on-one -on -one male uh, conversation, which I thought was awesome. Uh, he got to get it all out on the table, and then I got to, an opportunity to share uh, some scripture with him and pray with him. Uh, invited him to uh, one of our Bible studies that, uh, that I attend, and uh, he actually is going now every Tuesday morning uh, with us at 630 uh, to a Bible study. So, you know, God is, uh, is working uh, not only those that are non-Christians, but those that are Christians that have kind of uh, slipped away. And uh, just praise God. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. That's just awesome. That's just great. That's fantastic. Wow, these are great stories. So who, who would be next? Jim Cool. Or? I didn't feel in the form or anything. Yeah, that, that's, that's cool. Yeah. My name too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hadn't intended to say anything until last, yesterday. Uh, went out for lunch with my wife and Mr. Ha. Mr. Ha goes to LA Fitness, where I go to, and he uh, said, "You got to come on Friday because we got this really young, good-looking chick who's leading our aqua class." And uh, so that'll be my first challenge, whether I go there or not, at <laughs> nine nine o'clock well, today. <laughs> nine o'clock. We'll get. It. We have time. And uh, so anyway, so in Mr. Ha, she said, uh, I'd like to go out for lunch with you. So my wife and I went out for lunch with him yesterday, and it cost me 70 bucks. I can't believe that for lunch, but I'm one-third of it. Anyway, uh, we were talking, and, uh, and he's a Buddhist. And frankly, I have no idea how to connect to a Buddhist, none. If any of you can help me, I'd sure appreciate that. So we had lunch, and a long time, a two-hour lunch, and he's now invited me to go with his family of 80 people to Mexico for a uh, vacation, an all-inclusive vacation at this fancy hotel in Mexico. Unlimited drinks, unlimited food. He said, you'd love my family. He said, there's doctors, lawyers, attorneys, and everything else. But he said, they're so humble, you won't even know it. And just love to have you come with us. By the time I got home, I had the invitation, where the hotel is, who's going to handle the arrangements. So that's, you know, you just stumble into something, and I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. So that's just kind of my story. 
Uh, Jim, that's awesome. So, uh, so uh, Jim is thinking about becoming a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, reverse evangelism here. Dave. David Holbrook. Well, I could be the oldest guy here, except for Patty. I'm a year older than Patty is, but I've been coming uh, from the beginning. 30 years. And uh, Lyle told me to come up and speak. I said, what am I? I, don't, I had no idea I was even going to say anything, but I will say this. <clears throat> Men's ministry has been real important to me personally because over the years I've learned by sitting there for 30 years, there's a variety of ways to close the sale. And I'm not a salesman, and I've never, and Pat is a salesman, as you, as you know, and he has taught us you know, through this process of the unique problems that men have, that we're sometimes planting the seed, some of us are, you know, hoeing around the seed, and some of us are watering, and there occasionally occurs a time in our life when you, you actually see the harvest. Somebody does break down, and, and they hear Jesus knocking at the door, and they open the door. That's happened to perhaps everybody here. But <clears throat> the, the one thing that I want to try to remind, and this is the, the, the personal example, and over the years I've had a variety of friends, and I grew up here, so I went to high school here, know people and so forth. And there, there are events in life when God actually says to you, you know, you might want to just talk to this person. And uh, my wife and I go to a healing service on Tuesday night at All Saints. Some of you probably go there. I'm not Episcopalian, but it's a great place to go to meditate. People are at the very edge of their life. Some are losing their lives. Ran into an old high school friend of mine who was there, said hello to her. She said, uh, I asked about her, her husband, who was a friend of mine. She said, you need to go see him. So... Um, you know, I didn't think about it, didn't do anything about it. A couple of months later, it occurred to me, maybe I ought to call him. I did. He said, well, do you walk? And now that I'm semi-retired, I, you know, I do some of that stuff. So he said, well, I walk every Wednesday morning. And I, so I said, well, I'll walk with you. So he and his older friend walked, and we've been walking for a couple of years now. But during that process, there have been crises in each one of these men's lives, uh, one of which has been very public in this community, dealing with his family. Now, these are, these are men who have had, they've, they have walked with God at some point in time. But at that point in time, I was probably trying to water, trying to, to bring some comfort and also try to explain to them that, you know, God is not asleep, that he can work with you in these periods of time. So I'm, this one man, uh, very skeptical, the first one, horrible crisis in his life and his family life. Son may go to prison. The other man, <clears throat> I thought, well, God, now I know why you had me go there and to walk with him on Wednesday. But that wasn't the end of the story. Because the other man is dying. As we speak, he knows he's dying. And those of you who have suffered a prostate surgery or cancer, he's at the end stage of that. And he begs us, we're younger than he is, to walk with him. Hmm. And he's the one that opened the door and let Jesus in because of the crisis. The other man's a little younger. He isn't, he isn't sensing that. But my point in saying all that is, hey, we don't know what God brings for us. But over 30 years, I've discovered that it's not necessarily, you know, you saying, hey, come to Jesus or, or 
you know, a person, you see a person have a come to Jesus moment. It's a continuum for a lifetime. And each part of the day, you may have an opportunity to plant a seed, water the seed, harvest. But the point is, it won't be until heaven that we'll really see what God allowed us to participate in. I just wanted to leave that <laughs> as an experience. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, who's next? Don Walborn. Thank you, Pat. Yep. I guess my message to you this morning would be, if you're willing, God will use you where you're at. And um, recently I've had the privilege, opportunity to, to go down to the VA quite a bit, the VA Medical Center. And believe me, if there's a mission field, it's down there. You see vets from all over and they've got all kinds of problems. And not, nothing's fast down there at the VA Center. You go in there, you sit and you wait and you wait and you wait. But as, as you wait and start talking with fellows, you begin to realize that they're a mission field. And the first time I went down, I kept on saying, man, I wish I'd have brought my man and mirror book with me. So the second or third time, I started packing a couple into my briefcase, my knapsack, as I went down there. And as I was talking to people, it's not just a matter of just shoving a book at them, but as you talk, start talking to fellows and start hearing some of the things they're going through, you know, it's like Pat says, do you read? I said, you know, you're going through an awful lot. You know, there's an awful lot of things that are going on in your life. And I just let, want you to know I care. And there's some things here. This is a, a book that was written by a friend of mine up in Winter Park. And it's helped me an awful lot. Would you be interested in, in reading it? And more often than not, the answer is yes. And um, so I usually give them a card. I try to follow up with them by giving them a, a, another card for our man in the mirror breakfast here in the morning and saying, look, if you want to follow up, here's a good place to go. Here's a place you can plug in. But the thing is, be open, but be intentional too. Be intentional to, as you listen to them, to realize where their pain points are. And you're not going to have the answers to their pain point, but you can say, here's, here's something that's helped me. I'm sure it can help you too. And you'll be surprised how the Lord works. I'm, I've been surprised. I've, Ironically, I've run into the same man down there several times as a retired doctor from the medical center. And um, he's been very open about sharing to, to me then some of the struggles he's going through and how much it meant to, to him when I did take the time to uh, talk with him and share with him a little bit. So be intentional, and God puts you in a place. That's your mission field. That's great. Thank you so much, Don. <laughs> Got it. Yep. Beautiful, beautiful. So uh, you can see that men reaching men, uh, really just little, little small baby steps are wh where you really want to start. Just something as simple as sitting next to a guy in a waiting room at the VA <laughs> hospital and opening up a, a conversation and getting to know him a little bit. And uh, just how meaningful that, that can be. All right, so who's next? All right. Can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Okay, well, I guess um, I would start out by uh, overcoming, overcoming discouragement. You know, a couple years ago, I think I was called to talk to men, and I go out and meet people, um, tell them about uh, Jesus, and um, they were either totally turned off or just blew me off. And I was like, I thought I would just bring this word to people and they'd be like immediately going, this is great. Let's, let's jump on board and let's follow. Where's the, where's the nearest church? That didn't happen. All right. So um, uh, I've been working with, uh, with one person in my, in my town. Um, he's a physicist. And God, he just wants to tell me all the scientific reasons why God does not exist. You know, um, and name all the famous people who don't believe in uh, God either. And... Um, not just me, but um, another person who comes to the meeting here, um, Rob, uh, Rob Hughes, who sits at our table. He also bumped into this person and started talking to about um, Jesus with this person. We invited him up here to um, the Man of the Mirror meeting one morning. And um, 
he sat down at the table but really didn't listen. Um, I could tell that because he was um, writing stuff on, his, uh, on the back of his paper, which had nothing to do with the meeting. Um, but we're still trying. You know, I just saw him again this past weekend and uh, again spoke to him about all this um, scientific baloney. Uh, <laughs> it's not, I guess it's not baloney, but he's, um, uh, um, but he's like, so focused on these scientific facts that he's missing, you know, the real big picture. And um, uh, so again, therefore, I say, when you meet these people, you know, they're not, they're not gonna turn very quickly. I have not experienced that. But I would say, don't get discouraged and um, keep on engaging the people and uh, keep on telling the story. And um, if you do get attacked, because, um, you know, sometimes the person will get upset with you, you know, again, don't get discouraged over that either. Um, just keep on um, presenting Jesus in that light. Awesome. That's so great. You know, I remember that, uh, that, that guy that you invited, that physicist. I remember him. He's a, he's a, a very in, intriguing guy. So the, the, merge, the merging of science and, and faith, you know, a large percentage of scientists, you know, are Christians. You, you, you know this, right? And there's really nothing. So science discovers truth uh, through the investigation of facts, through experimentation and observation. And uh, Einstein said that we need both science and theology because science uh, tells us how and theology tells us why. And so the merger of these and and so when science really does break through, and I realize that new scientific discoveries have to go through the adoption process, you have early adopters, and then you have people who are more reticent and are late adopters and so forth of these scientific ideas. Uh, some people think climate change is bogus, other people are, are uh, all on board with it, and that's fine. I mean, you know, that's not, that's not the issue that we're trying to debate. But the point is, is that <clears throat> there's nothing that science has ever discovered that has been in true contradiction with the Bible. So the science actually helps us discover and understand more of the mysteries of the Bible. And so there's nothing to fear from science. I don't know why I needed to say that or felt like I needed to. I probably didn't need to say that, but I felt like I needed to say that. All right, so who would like to be next? Yep, Jim. Jim Long. Good morning. Good morning. It's an awesome day. Hi, I'm Jim, and I'm a drug addict. Been clean since 1986, so I guess you can say I was established in 1986 also. Um, seven years ago, I was asked to come down to a drug treatment center and help out some fellas, so I have an unlimited uh, opportunity to share this uh, overflow of Jesus that I have with other folks. Uh, part of my duties is to lead a Bible study on Wednesday night, and I'm currently working on my third book, my third case of books uh, from Man in the Mirror. Uh, currently, I'm working on is Christianity for me because I have a couple guys down there that are on the fence with Islam and Christianity. So it's real easy for me to do, do that discipleship stuff because of the opportunities out there, um, but it has become easy for me to do that because um, I had somebody from this room equip me um, in how to, to disciple others. Uh, and I know a lot of folks in here are discipling people. Um, and even for those of you that are, but I'm really saying to those of you that aren't, um, I think what we haven't heard this morning was Pat's statement of, it takes a man to teach a man how to be a man, and in order to be that man that could teach a man, I think it, uh, you can turbocharge that with getting a mentor. And uh, what started out to be an eight-week uh, mentorship with uh, somebody turned out to be two-and-a-half-year relationship that a man built with me that enabled me to uh, share my overflow of Jesus with other folks. So anyway, when Pat asked... Uh, us to, suggested that we 
have somebody uh, ask him out to coffee, I'm saying, well, 8 o'clock at night after Bible study is a little bit too late to invite somebody out to coffee because I'm up at 4 in the morning like most of you guys are. So I said, well, let's go out to the tailgate and let's talk. So we, we, we do that now, and it, it's been really neat. It's been really neat. Um, like I said, I have a captive audience. These folks are down there at a drug rehab, and they have to stay there. So I have that advantage over a lot of other folks in, in my little ministry. But I just want to say that, that um, you've got to have a mentor to teach you how to be one. Mm, that's awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. So can you imagine uh, what's going to happen and it takes a long time to build these relationships sometimes, and sometimes they go quickly. Can you imagine what's going to happen in the lives of these men that you have begun to engage? And I think, I think we have 76 men who have indicated they've already initiated some kind of contact. 76 men, that's how many hands we got during week four. Uh, so we know that there are at least 76 men who have initiated contacts. We also know from the data that you completed in the survey a couple weeks ago or last week, whatever it was, that many of you have been actually initiating with multiple men. Several of you have gone with two men. Uh, 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 more than a handful have initiated with three men, and some of you have actually initiated with uh, four or more men. And so uh, the, the, the total number of contacts is already somewhere over 100, and that's just in the first six weeks. So just imagine how different this community is going to be as we faithfully execute this idea of just simply one cup of coffee can change the world. And just think about over the next 10 years, all the conversations you're going to have, whether it's one a week or one a month or one a year, if you have 100 men having, having uh, 10 conversations a year, that's 1,000 men, that's 10,000 men over the course of the next decade, can you imagine the impact on this community, how those families will be dramatically altered. Many of those men will come to faith in Christ or come back to faith in Christ, and their entire family lineage is going to be set on an, a whole new course for generations to come, and their children and their children's children are going to know Jesus Christ and have the peace of Christ ruling in their hearts, and they're going to have a biblical worldview. They're going to have a relationship with God. They're going to have a lifestyle worthy of Christ, and it's going to continue this to be a beacon city in the whole of the United States because of your faithfulness to go out and reach men. This is awesome. This is awesome. Don't, don't think we're just talking about having a cup of coffee with somebody. It's so much bigger than that. Who would be next? Okay. Brad Kriegler. Thank you, Pat. <clears throat> One of the <clears throat> key um, messages I got from Pat a while back was uh, he said, we need to get out there and make ourselves approachable. Live a Christian life, um, act in ways, uh, proclaim him, um, make it known who you believe in and, and do it with all of your heart. And through that process, the example I'm going to give you is as a result of that, you make yourself approachable, someone can come to you with something very serious. Um, every once in a while, we, I would have lunch with uh, a guy, and eventually he came to the point of saying, my marriage is in trouble. Can you help me? And he was ready to cry, and it was very serious. He was about to, to he, he thought he uncovered some things. Um, he shared with me some personal deep issues that uh, was hard for, for him to talk about, but he felt safe 
because God gives us a, a, a an area of an ability to be able to pro project a willingness to listen and have compassion and hear and deliver his word. And so he had the faith, enough faith, to open up to me. And through that process, the next day, we had lunch again. And all of a sudden, it became a daily lunch to talk about the issues. And we went through things one by one. And eventually, he put into practice some of the things that we talked about. And at the end of this six-week or eight-week time frame that we've been going, he said, I want to thank you for helping me see what I needed to see and implement the things that I needed to implement because my wife and I are coming back together in a great way. I think we're going to make it because of this. <laughs> That's amazing. God is good. Uh, yes, he is. Thank you so much, Brad. Wow. All right, well, that's just so wonderful. Uh, that's a great place to stop. Let's tie it off. Let's give all the men who shared a big round of applause, expressing our gratitude to them. Thank you, guys, one and all. Great stories of how men are reaching men, and why is it important? Because it takes a man to teach a man how to be a man. So let's just talk about a little bit where we go from here. Where do we go from here? So as you're out and about, just remember the, uh, you've heard me talk about the seven symptoms. So I, I've, you've, you also know that, that I love getting with guys and uh, I've literally had thousands of these luncheons and coffees with men over the last 40, 40 years. You'd do the math, it's not that, that often really, but you know, when you have this much blonde hair, uh, you, can, you can say something like having met with thousands of men. If you're in your 20s, you probably can't say that yet, but anyway. And uh, so these are the seven, seven most common symptoms that you will find men experiencing when their lives are off track, when they have these inner aches and pains that we have heard some of this morning. I just feel like I'm in this all alone. There are a lot of guys out there, they're, they're just lonely. Uh, you heard it here this morning, they don't have friends. I don't have any friends. I just feel like I'm in this alone. And by the way, it happens here too. So, you know, we're guys too. You know, if God wasn't working with flawed men, he wouldn't have any men to work with at all. So it's not, it's not like it's them and us. It's like all of us together. I just feel like I'm in this alone. I don't feel like God cares about me personally. Not really. Maybe they grew up in a church and had some bad things happen, maybe some, some broken relationships, maybe some, some, loss, some losses of people they love, and they just don't feel like God cares about them personally, not really. They don't feel like their, their life has a purpose. They feel like they're just being pummeled by random events. Uh, they don't have a sense of meaning and purpose. Uh, they have, number four, they have destructive behaviors that they feel like keep dragging them back down. Maybe they're addicted to pornography or something else. Um, or they're, number five, uh, my soul feels dry. You know, okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm a, I, I have, I've been a person, of, I made a profession of faith, but you know, I just, I feel so dry, spiritually dry. And, uh, and then number six is that my most important relationships, they're not healthy, <clears throat> not really. I don't know how to be a husband. I don't know how to be a father. I don't know how to be a friend. I don't know how to do, do these things. Uh, you know, if, if I was taught how to do it, I've forgotten, or maybe I wasn't taught at all, but my most important relationships, they're just not healthy. And then finally, I don't really feel like I'm doing anything that will make a difference and leave the world a better place. <laughs> So just keep in mind that, that when you're out there, of course, you feel these things too. Some of you are feeling these things. Now I can, you know, I read the faces, so I know what's going on. So we, we all have these things by degrees from time to time. And so uh, as you have experienced them either now or in the past yourselves, you know that every person you meet 
No matter how good looking they are, no matter how chiseled they are, no matter how charismatic they are, you can know for sure that, that these seven symptoms are either actively going on in their lives or if you will build a friendship with them uh, within the next 12 months, something, one of those things is going to happen in that man's life. You, just, you can just know that. You can go to the bank on that. Uh, are there exceptions? Yeah, sure. But you can go to the bank on that. It's going to happen 99% of the time. So, if you have not yet, if you raise your hand at the beginning, and remember, I told you, don't raise your hands for me. I said, this is between you and the Lord. So we all raised our hands. I, I, I didn't see anybody who didn't raise their hand. That, that we, would make, uh, we, we would say that we, before the Lord, that we were going to be a man who wanted to reach other men. And we were going to make a commitment to at least have a cup of coffee with that one guy. So if you haven't done that yet, it's not a problem. Grace, lots of grace. We said this is a long-term process. And uh, you may not have run across the guy yet. But I want to encourage you, keep these seven symptoms in mind. And uh, keep in mind the, 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 this idea that, that, that you never know. You never know that one cup of coffee can change an entire, as I said, an entire family lineage for generations to come. So you have, that is the potential. Uh, so where do we go from here? Let's, let's just keep doing this. And then for those of us who now have, have experienced this and uh, maybe for the first time, and you realize, oh, this is actually not as hard as I thought it would be. You realize that the, the, the devil's been whispering uh, in your ear, and now you realize that uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So, um, a, couple of, a couple of ideas that didn't make it in. Uh, if we had done uh, a nine-week series, we would have had a, a couple of more big ideas. These could have been them. These are ideas that I... So distressed that I didn't get to share. I'm going to share, share them anyway. They're kind of like the, you know, after the movie credits, they show you a few clips that they, that, that got on the, uh, got the, the last couple clips that uh, ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, these are those two ideas. Discipleship is one man taking another man under his wing and showing him the ropes. It's as simple as this. It's as simple. It's just, discipleship is just, just take a guy under your wing and show him the ropes. And we know that evangelism is just taking a man as far as he wants to go toward Jesus at any particular moment. It's the same way with all of the discipleship ideas, helping him grow with a worldview that's biblical and a lifestyle worthy of Christ. And then the other one, just anything, anything works. Anything that gives a man an opportunity to think more deeply about his relationship with God, his worldview, or uh, this, this idea of his lifestyle. It counts. Anything you do counts, no matter how big, no matter how small. Taking, taking a Buddhist to lunch uh, and, and, and letting him convert you. Uh, anything counts. <laughs> anything counts. It, it, you know, being nice to somebody at the gym. Hey, let me say this. When, when traffic is during rush hour, uh, very thick, and you pause, and you let somebody in from a side street, you know what that is? That's, that's a form of evangelism. Let's call it pre-evangelism. But th that act of kindness counts. Anything that we do, anything that we do that demonstrates our faith. Remember, Brett Clymer said that the foundation of, of all that we're doing is, is love. Any act of love or kindness does have an impact. Now, that person will probably never know that you did it because you're a Christian. But it will change their state of mind, their perception of mankind, make them more open. Who knows that maybe in the sovereignty of God, he was orchestrating you to let that person in because he had had a fight with his wife and, and he was going to be late to work and now he's not late to work and, and so now he's in a better mood and, and so then, and then one of the other guys in the room, 
and scheduled a cup of coffee with him for later in the morning. And now he's going to be more receptive. You just don't know how the mosaic is being put together by God at any particular moment. Now on your tables, you also have these um, <clears throat> accountability cards. We've given these to you before, and I'd like to encourage you to pick up one of these. So, <clears throat> there are two, two main things to do. Two main things to do. Two main things to think about when you're, when you're helping a man become a disciple of Jesus, when you're reaching a man, there are two things that are differentiated success factors. In other words, there are two things that if a man will do, he will have the highest possible probability of spiritual success. <clears throat> These are the two things that successful spiritual men do that unsuccessful, tepid, lukewarm spiritual men don't do. So you might think, well, go to church. Well, lots of tepid men go to church. So going, ch going to church is not a differentiated success factor. It might be a success factor, but it's not something that differentiates the successful men from the unsuccessful men. The two things, and I, by the way, after working with men for 40 years, I'm a little embarrassed that it boils down to these two things, but, but the, this, this is it. So when you build these relationships of men, you know, where do we go from here? When you build these relationships of men, it takes a man to teach a man to be a man. When you're building these intentional spiritual friendships, here are the two things that you, I think, want to ultimately help men do. Number one is to be in the Word of God. Read the, read the Bible for themselves several times a week. There's some scholarly research that indicates that uh, about four times a week is a tipping point. Four or more times a week is a kind of a tipping point. So you should be encouraging men just to read the, get into the Bible for themselves. Um, you know, 10, 10 minutes a day, four days a week, something like that, uh, or, or more. And then the second thing is, is to be in a small group with some other guys and just doing life together, life on life. It's as simple as that. As I say, it's a little embarrassing. Uh, I, I don't have a bigger prescription after all these, these years, but those are the two things that I encourage you to do. Now, if you want to take a next step, and Brian, let's show them the, uh, the website here. So, uh, you know, at Man in the Mirror, what we do is we help men reach men. That's what we do. And so we have on our website, it says, we help men, disciple men, four ways you can take the next step. I uh, want to show this to you just so briefly, and then you could uh, go there. Find out how, click that button, and then it takes you to this website. You'll see four buttons from left to right, helping uh, other churches disciple men, uh, help um, uh, building a ministry to the men in, in, uh, in my church, uh, making disciples, and then growing as a disciple. So no matter where you are on the continuum of just getting started or wanting to reach a couple guys or help your whole church or even help churches in your community, uh, you can go to this website and then click on the one, which, whichever of those four buttons is more attractive to you. Brian, let's click on Build a Ministry to the Men in My Church since that's a, a little bit deeper than we've gone in the series. So this would kind of like to be a next step. It takes you to this page. And uh, just if you scroll down a little bit, you, so learn uh, how you can apply the No Man Left Behind model. Uh, there's some webinars for leadership teams. You can enroll your church in the journey to biblical manhood. Schedule men's events. Uh, come to our Fuel Leaders meeting at the end of February. Uh, distribute books to, for men. You've heard a lot about that this morning. You can start a Man of the Mirror Bible study like we're doing here by doing one of the video studies. You know, we have hundreds and hundreds. Uh, we have... Uh, we, we, we say we have 10,000 men in the Bible study. Uh, we don't have any, we really have no idea, but it's probably more like 15,000 guys, but we just say 10 to be conservative. But hundreds of groups meeting all over the world. You know, men, we, we're, we're in every, all 50 states and 80 countries around the world. There, there are men reaching men with uh, men and resources. You can start or lead a small group for men. You can, we have a daily devotional magazine. 
Uh, you can get the uh, emails. We have uh, regular emails on different topics to equip leaders. Uh, discipleship blog, uh, uh, the marriage prayer to honor your spouse, uh, the accountability we just talked about. Uh, you can search the website for virtually any topic on, 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 under Sam Hill. Uh, and then if you go back to the top, Brian, uh, you can also uh, register as a, as a leader. We'll send you a series of emails. Each of these has, each of these four buttons that, that we showed you has a series of emails you can, can receive that takes you a little bit further in depth. You don't have to try to digest all this at one time. And so I want to encourage you, uh, as you uh, find the, the passion uh, or the calling or both, to disciple men, to reach more men, that you uh, check out this and just see how we might be able to help you take uh, more steps with that. And so with that said, I think it's about time to tie it off. Uh, why don't we uh, just give a, a, a round of applause to our first-time visitors. If you're a first-timer, would you raise your hands just so we can see where you are, first-time visitors, here and here, and let's give them a, a big round of applause. And uh, we're not going to do first and second time table this morning. We'll just kind of like move all that forward uh, uh, two weeks. Next week is Thanksgiving. We'll not be here, so obviously uh, keep that in mind. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our dearest Father, thank you for this series, Men Reaching Men. We thank you for the men who are reaching men. And just, Lord, how thrilling it is, how exciting it is uh, to, to, to see uh, men who have been doing this for a long time, uh, getting uh, uh, f fired up even more. And then also, but the men who are doing it for the first time, Lord, who are kind of taking these baby steps and uh, just uh, little toddlers really uh, at it. But, but just for them to see the, the, to hear and see the joy that they're experiencing as they see uh, men responding in different ways. So Father, we pray that we would be uh, not just a fellowship here in Orlando, but we would be a force. And uh, for all the people who are online and their communities too, Lord, we pray that our Man in the Mirror Bible studies would be both a fellowship and a force in our communities. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.